I'm delighted to welcome Martin Perry to the to the Tuesday night live session tonight. Um, Martin Martin's our, our leading Barrett table tennis player and has got an incredible story th um, through his journey. And I'm even more grateful that he's that he's doing this whilst he's in holiday. He's currently in Orkney at the moment, um, so and the Wi-Fi is strong. So we're, we're we're delighted that he's here and doing this as 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 a favour to us. So without further ado, I will pass it across to, to Martin and our, our host Gavin. Um, and, and enjoy the show. Thanks, Gary. Thanks, thanks for the for the introductions. And uh, Martin, just really to echo what, uh, what what Gary was saying there in the introduction. Many thanks for for giving up your time. And uh, you're an old friend uh, of SDS's, so it's 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 great to have you back again and to to be able to spend a bit of time with you and and hear your story. Um, do you want, do you want to start off by just telling us? Uh, you know, how you got involved into sport, the sort of the early days, Martin, your, your school experience, and and uh, it's probably your route into into your chosen sport. Mm, yeah, I think uh, for me, first of all, thanks for having me. Uh, thank you for that. So thanks for inviting me on. But for me, um, sport in my life actually started way, way, way before school. Um, so I'm the youngest of four boys. Uh, so my poor mum at home, she struggled a lot with uh, four very energetic boys in the household. So the one thing we would do is go out and play football together. We'd um, run around and chase each other and, and just play games and have fun. And, you know, I think at the time I didn't realise that that was my introduction to sport. It was just playing with my family and, and, and playing, you know, games with my brothers where they would just chuck me into everything and anything. And, you know, I think, obviously, as I said, looking back on that, I probably took that for granted at the time because I didn't realise that that was sport. You know, it was just having fun with family and, and things like that. But it wasn't really until um, I started to get a little bit older. And as I said, I'm the youngest. So, you know, brothers were moving away and living with partners and having kids and things like that. And I was still just wanting to play sport and run around because I was a young teenager. I was 12 to 13 at the time and just looking for stuff to do. Um, and I got involved uh, with uh, an ambulant football club, uh, the West of Scotland Football Club for the Physically Disabled. And, and that was, uh, for me, that was, that was amazing because I got to play sport every week, got to play football and made great friends and, and, and travelled up and down the UK with them. And, and, and that was awesome. But knowing how sport works and, and you know, the, the, the goals that I had set for myself from a very early age of, you know, I want to go and be the best that I can be in whatever sport, you know, I didn't, it's not, I'm not one of these, I'll be honest, I didn't sit down at a young age and go, right, I'm going to be a footballer, I'm going to do this and I'm going to do that. I just loved playing sport and I knew that I wanted to play sport to the highest level that I possibly could. And uh, while I was playing football, I, I realised that, you know, at the time there wasn't a system in place that I could have played for Scotland because uh, it was all CP football. Um, so I realised that I couldn't really go any further. And it was at that time uh, when I was sort of transitioning from sort of a teenager into adult, you know, 15, 16 years old. And I was going through high school and I um, ended up playing rugby for the, the school's seven team, able-bodied uh, team which, uh, again, I didn't think anything of it. I was just a big guy. I've been over six foot from a very young age, um, so I've always been a big lump of a boy. And I was playing, playing rugby for the school team, had a great time. Uh, we managed to win the Renfrewshire Sevens Cup, and there was then a photo of me in the local paper. Uh, and I've, you know, covered head to toe in muck. Just <laughs> sounds, <laughs> sounds great to me, thinking back on it. You know, like, they all skill to run around with your mates. That's brilliant. And um, so, yeah, so... I, I remember Scottish Disability Sports seeing that photograph and, and contacted the school and said, you know, look, you've got, uh, 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 you know, <laughs> let, let's say what it is, a, a very disabled person playing able-bodied sport for their age group. You know, why, why, why are we not in contact with this person? And you know, you guys, um, you know, started that connection and 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 invited me along to one of the the famous. Inverclyde summer camps, um, <laughs> or, or infamous maybe, but, uh, uh, Martin's uh, better uh, words as well. Yeah, I never said it. I never <laughs> said it. <laughs> but yeah, so it's um, and that that's where it all started. I went to one of the Inverclyde camps. I think it was 2011, the year that I was there, and we tried loads of different sports. It was amazing. I, I had great fun. Um, but what I love about that story is that I didn't actually I didn't actually want to go. 
Um, I didn't want to go to the camp because I didn't want to be labelled as going to a disabled camp. I didn't, you know, I was just, I was just Martin. I played sport with my friends. I played football with my brothers. And even though I was playing football for the disabled team, we were all very able guys, you know, very, very minimum disabilities. And I would consider myself in that in that category. Even though I've only got one limb, I, I feel like I can do everything and anything. So I wasn't really disabled. So I didn't want to go to a disabled camp. And um, I remember sitting down talking to my family and uh, Becky Visland, who was obviously a big part of Scottish Disability Sport, and 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 Lynn Allison, and they were like, "Oh no, we need you need to come to this camp. It's going to be great. You need to do it." <laughs> and, um, and so they had a chat with my my mom, and she was like, "No, you're going to go." So eventually, I went, and I, I I loved it. I thought the camp was amazing, and I felt so just stupid that I didn't want to be a part of this you know why didn't I want to be a part of this awesome thing that was happening so I think the funny part of that story is that I didn't want to be there and the fact that I went to the camp was arguably one of the better things I've ever done because it's led me to table tennis which has changed my entire life you know because at the camps you try loads of different sports and you know for me table tennis was there and I just had a really good fun time and it sort of very quickly just snowballed and started me on that journey yeah there was there was a certain coach there a certain individual that um spotted your talent in in that sport martin and um and sort of uh, guided you and, and was a, a great support for you i know do you, do you want to tell us a bit about about terry yeah so on on the on on the camp on the final day of the camp uh terry from drum chapel table tennis club was there with a, a couple of young players from his club um very talented players, you know, a number of junior champions and stuff from all the different age groups. And uh, I just, I was just playing, having fun. And and one of the guys that I was playing table tennis with, uh, Scott Barton, he said to Terry, he said, he's, he's all right. Like he can kind of play a little bit. And I was just oblivious. I was just having, having fun playing. And, and Terry came over to me and I mean, Gavin, you know what, you know what Terry's like. He just shouts at you and then makes you feel so at home and, and um, so he just he was like, hey, you're coming to my club. And I was like, oh, right, okay, I don't know who you are. Um, and I was a bit sort of taken aback, but he just sort of matched up to me and was like, hey, you're coming to my club. And um, uh, I'm so glad that he did because table tennis has taken me all over the world. And, you know, it's, it's always been from Terry, you know, seeing, trusting his athletes to say, this guy's all right, get him to the club. And he trusted his athlete that day. Um, and then since then, Terry's been so supportive. You know, he's always said that whatever I want to do in table tennis is completely achievable, and and I'll have his complete backing and support. And and you know, the amount of stuff that he's done for me over the years has been, you know, has has been to no end. He's he's just such a great guy. And you know, even when I had to move down to to England to train full time with the with the GB team, you know, Terry was always in contact and. And making sure that things were going all right my way because you know he knew that I was the only Scottish guy down there, um, you know, and he he was still looking after me even though I was five hundred miles away, you know, and uh, that just for me that just shows what a great guy he is and and how much he just loves his sport and loves the athletes that he helps, you know, he sees them as a family, um, and for me I, I wouldn't be I wouldn't be doing this talk today if it wasn't for Terry, you know, he he got me into table tennis and and showed me that anything is possible with the sport, so. I won't beg him up too much, though. He might be watching. <laughs> <laughs> he might, he might get wind. He might get wind. It's, I mean, it's quite a daunting prospect, though, uh, Martin. Uh, you, you gloss over it a wee bit, but in terms of, you know, a young, a young lad going into a mainstream um, a club environment like that, uh, how, how did they make you sort of feel welcome and, you know, want to go back and to be part of the club? They, they, they treated me like anyone else. You know, um, there was no. Oh, he's got no hands, he's got one leg, how is he going to play table tennis? Teddy just flung me on a table and was like, figure it out, we'll, we'll coach you whatever way we can, but you need to go and try it and go have fun. And, you know, the thing about Drum Chapel is that there is, you know, it's no holds barred, you get treated like everyone else and, you know, you get you get made fun of the way you would do with your family and things like that. And it's it, that whole environment that surrounds the club just made me feel at ease and at home straight away because no one was afraid to say anything or ask anything or do anything it was just very much like okay just get on with it and that's obviously something that I live my life in that sort of manner is you know just get up and get on with it and there's no point in worrying about it and the guys from Drum Chapel 
um, you know, were, were straight away on board with that and they'd take the mick out of me for bad table tennis technique because that's the way that I've played and things like that and I loved that because it reminded me of my brothers that would do the same when we played football together and then, you know, it just, it just brings that whole family environment together. So for the guys at the club to just treat me like anyone else and, you know, just have that no holds barred, having a laugh with each other but we're still old friends and that, that was great. So, you know, for, for, for the people at the club just to be normal for want of a better phrase you know just it just it was just the same i was just another guy there trying to play table tennis and in terms of the early sort of competitive um experience that you had uh martin and and i suppose how, how did did that talent that you, you obviously had and terry saw on you how how did that sort of evolve then over over the first few years or or how long did it take before you you felt you you were at that sort of talent level um I mean, of course, I still think I'm constantly developing and then progressing as an athlete. But for me, I I struggled in the beginning with the skill development. You know, trying to play table tennis with no hands is a bit of a challenge. Um, so the initial skill development took a long time for me to grasp. Um, and that actually made me more determined to be successful because I could, you know, I knew that this was a challenging sport for me and it was something that was... Um, somewhat restrictive in terms of, you know, it really did test my abilities and test my disability. So that, the the somewhat constant failure of, you know, playing league matches and losing and going to competitions, local ones and losing and things like that, uh, it actually made me more determined to, to go and work on my craft and improve. Um, and then, you know, with under the guidance of Terry and stuff, he'd, you know, he'd drive me all up and down the country to competitions and things and and he was like, you would always tell me, you know, just just keep chipping away at it, just keep chipping away at it. You know, you, you, you work incredibly hard and one day that's going to pay off. And um, a couple of years down the line, I think it was 2013, I got invited to a GB camp as like a development athlete sort of thing. And, and I was on their development programme for a long time. Um, I think I was on a development programme for five, maybe six years. Um, and it was all about just that, you know, just keep working hard because you're doing the right things. And, and you know, I think that's just always been the start of it is the fact that I've, it's not been a straight shot to the top for me. It's been quite, it's been quite a slow, steady build. And I think that that makes me more determined to keep improving because it's not all went my way. You know, I've had a lot of setbacks and, and, and things like that. So it's just that constant determination to fight against the the somewhat negatives of the game you know when you're losing and, and things like that and that keeps me going and that makes me more determined and I think that's what helps me improve and brings that competitiveness. It, there, there, within, within all sports there's innovation uh, Martin but uh, I remember when we when we had you at the summer camp we, we started you playing I think we were using velcro to attach the <laughs> to attach the, uh, the, the bat uh, to, to, to your limb but uh, can you tell us here yeah, because I know there's been some, um, some some input into your prosthetics and uh, your equipment and uh, how much of a difference has that made and how vital is that to you as a player? Massively. Um, so as you said, on, on day one on the camp, uh, it was it was pretty much like a makeshift tea towel with Velcro on it, as you said. So we, we wrapped the, this red piece of cloth around my right forearm and then like strapped a bat in place with, because that created like a sleeve housing unit sort of thing. And then we strapped it in place with Velcro. Um, and it was so basic and primitive, but it, it got me playing. You know, it got me just initially playing and then... Um, uh, Terry got someone at the club um, within within the first day of me being there. Terry Terry had asked someone at the club, uh, Liam, to 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 make an extended handle. So he crafted a table tennis handle um, for the bat that was maybe three and a half times larger than uh, a regular one, and that was so it could sit down my forearm a little bit better uh, and hold on better with the velcro. And then after going to a couple of GB camps, the the, the GB coaches were like, "Oh, actually, there's." handful of players like yourself with similar disabilities and they have prosthetic arms and I'd never thought about a prosthetic arm uh, and then so they were like you should really look into it so I watched a couple of YouTube videos of the guys that they had said were similar to me and and then we 
contacted the, the hospital in Glasgow who agreed to make me some prosthetic arms to try and play table tennis with. And they don't have hands or anything. It's just a mold of my arm uh, with a bat glued onto the end so it can't go anywhere because Velcro only holds on for so long as uh, Terry found out ducking at the club one night. But, um, <laughs> but yeah, so we, we've, we've innovated loads with um, prosthetics. We've tried, you know, lots of different housing units and materials and just different ideas to try and keep my arm cool for example and one of the one of the favorite arms that we ever had a prototype of was uh, an arm that had like ventilation holes built all along it so I could keep nice and cool when I'm playing and what we didn't realize at the time that that would just then let all the sweat out at the same time so it would keep you cool by letting everything else out. So yeah. I'd be playing table tennis and there's, it was disgusting. There's just sweat flying everywhere. So that one quickly got scrapped. That quickly got scrapped. And then for me, for me, the massive, the massive jump in performance came when I got a suitable prosthetic leg. Um, for, for I think the first five, six years of my playing career, I played with what you would class as an everyday walking leg, you know, so it's got the knee unit and it can bend and things like that. But, that of course limited my functional ability around the table because you know I was too scared to step on the leg with too much pressure because the knee would bend and then I'd be on the floor so eventually um, once I started to make a little bit of progress I was sort of eligible for a, a running blade um, and that, that massively improved my performance because I, I could put everything through the prosthetic knowing that I'm going to get the return that I need and, and you know, after getting the prosthetics right and the equipment around me right, I've I seen a massive shoot up in my performance and in my world ranking. And, and you know, I think it's just all about that trial and error process because it's difficult in the beginning because all you want to do is obviously play and succeed. But we had to get the equipment right first and foremost, otherwise it wouldn't have happened. Yeah, it's such an important part of any athlete that, that's playing, having the right equipment and, and the right support. Then... Um, Martin, for for you know, for many athletes, the the whole process of classification that's obviously unique to to, to our area uh, of sport. Um, you know, you, you hear um, varying degrees of of experience that going through that process. How how is it for you? How did you find that? And uh, you know, how does it work within table tennis? Um, so for table tennis, the eleven classifications, uh, classes one to five being wheelchair classes. Uh, a class one would be like a very high neck break, like a C3, C4 neck break. Um, so obviously, you know, limited functionality below like shoulder height and they need the back strap to their arm. Uh, and as you move up, the higher the number, the more sort of able-bodied you would get. So a one, as I said, is a very high neck break, whereas a five could be a severe cerebral palsy case. Um, so they've got, you know, fairly good trunk control, but can't walk, you know, definitely need to use a wheelchair day in, day out, um, and obviously, you know, there's a little bit of wiggle room in between those stages. Classes 6 to 10 would be stand-in players, uh, a 6 being someone like myself, so severely affected on three or more limbs or two very severely on the same side or half of the body. Um, so as you go up the numbers again, heading towards a 10, you would be, for want of a better phrase, more able-bodied. You know, so at a time would be someone with a very minimal disability that doesn't necessarily hinder their table tennis game to, you know, very much of a degree at all. Um, and class 11 is a uh, learning disability. Um, so for me, for me, the whole classification process, I'm very fortunate that for me it was very quick, simple and easy uh, because I'm a stonewall six. There's no, <laughs> there's no wiggle room at all uh, with me, you know, so I'm a stonewall six. So I remember... Uh, at the, the, the competition where I had to get internationally classified was the Hungarian Open in 2013 and, and we were sat in this corridor and it's just lined with athletes ready to go in for classification and, and there was no real system to it. It was almost like a first come first serve that's changed now where it is very systematic and you go at this time and, and, and it's all done that way but when I was there it was very much first come first served and I remember the classifier sort of like poking his head out the door and sort of having a look up and down and he seen me and he was like, you come first because you'll be easy. <laughs> so, um, so for me, I was, uh, I was very fortunate that classification was a bit of a breeze. But I've got athletes in my team that it's been an absolute nightmare and still having ongoing battles. And, you know, I, because of that experience of my team, I understand that 
classification, you know, you need to get it right because you're not just playing with someone's sport, you know, affecting their livelihood, you know, because the the right classification or the wrong classification could be the difference between a Paralympic medal and not even qualifying for the games. You know, so it's uh, it's massively important. But thankfully for me, it was it was very simple and easy. Good. So, so you made you talked to me a bit earlier about your your transition onto the onto the to the GB uh, development program, and then the, obviously onto the the world class program. Uh, uh, following that, how, how was that process? Um, I suppose. How was it moving to a centralised program south of the border? Being the only Scot, you referred to that earlier as well. Um, how, how was that experience? And, and talk us through a wee bit about what your you saw your your regime is, Martin, in terms of high performance training and and competition. Mm, so when we are in you know full time training, obviously things are a bit different at the moment. But a standard week for us would be um, two sessions uh, on a Monday, Tuesday, and Thursday. Uh, with and then one session on a Wednesday, Friday. So we do about 18 to 20 hours on the table each week. And then between those breaks that we have between sessions, we do strength and conditioning programs at least three days a week. We work with our sports psychologists, um, you know, some of the guys that are still trying to balance university or college or whatever, they, they work closely with like the lifestyle manager and things like that to make sure, you know, they've got that relationship with the university and and the team so that you can sort of work around exams and things like that you know so it's 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 very much a full-time job you know we're in we're in the, in the training facility from nine to five every day um working as i said either on the table or off it with other various members of staff but for me that was a massive change because i went from two nights a week at the local club in drum chapel where i trained for maybe two three hours a night um on a tuesday and a thursday to then as the camps, when I got into the development camps, you'd go down for a weekend and have, you know, one session Saturday morning, one session Saturday evening, and then either one session Sunday or sometimes two sessions Sunday. Um, because obviously people have got to travel from all over, you know, so that was still only twice a week that I'd be doing that, uh, that, that training. So to go to that full-time jump Monday to Friday, nine to five, uh, was a massive, massive shock for me. Um, you know, just the the sheer physical difference of it, and and you know, so it took me a while to to adjust to that, and um, for a while, my my performance it took a little bit of time to sort of steady out because I was I was sort of doing this up and down, up and down, and trying to get used to the program and things like that, and you'd go through a little bit of a good spell and think, oh, the you know the program's doing great and it's working fantastically, but then actually, if you're not used to it, you get you can get you know, very tired very quickly and, and, and things like that. So it took a lot of adjusting. But now I've been I've been doing it for uh, five, maybe I think five and a half years now, almost six. Um, I've been in that full time setup. So it's um it's you know it's it's, it's the status quo for me now. Um, but obviously with everything that's going on at the moment, it's it's difficult to train. So you know, so what it looks like for me at the moment is that as a team we'll do Zoom calls like this. Um, and do like an at-home strength and conditioning session, you know, and um, they've been fantastic, you know, doing like squats and stuff and lunges and all that, all, all functional training for our sport in the living room. Um, I must look daft when the neighbours walk by, but it's, uh, it's, it's been great fun. And, and so we're, we're keeping busy off the table as much as we can. And we'll do other Zoom sessions where we do what we call shadow play in table tennis. So usually use it as a warm-up in table tennis just to get the heart rate up and the temperature up so you're ready for the session. But without having access to a table and a training partner, that's all we've got at the moment. So we will do about 30 to 45 minutes each day um, doing the shadow play where it's high intensity uh, and, and obviously a little bit longer than what we would do on a regular training schedule. But it's, it's all we can do at the moment. Um, so we're desperate to get back into training. But yeah, that initial jump to two nights a week to twice a day, <laughs> five days was um, in the beginning, of course, very exciting. Because um, I was like, oh, wow, I get to go train full time. I'm doing it. You know, this is amazing. But it was it was tough. It was a tough jump. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I saw um, some Facebook footage of you doing your uh, your training regime in the in the in the front living room, and uh, I, I was tired just watching it, Martin. So it's it's a good it's it's, it's a workout that you're giving yourself even in, in lockdown. 
uh, which is great. Um, you, you talked a wee bit about you know the, the competitive side of things. T talk a wee, wee bit about some of the some of the competitions you've been to, your your successes, um, uh, and what's been your proudest moment to date in terms of of your your, your table tennis career. Um, I think in terms of a, a singles performance, um, winning the the British Championships back to back was pretty awesome. That was a great feeling for me. Um, especially the first year that I won it, I had to defeat, you know, a three-time Paralympian and an and incredible athlete, uh, David Weatherall, another member of the GB team. You know, he's done a lot of great things throughout his career and, you know, he's ranked inside the top five in the world. Um, and for me, that was, you know, that was incredible to, to do that and then to go on and defend my title the next year. Um, sadly, I couldn't make it three in a row because due to all of all of the the COVID stuff, we had to ch cancel our national championship. So I'm hoping when it when it, everything gets back to to normal, I can defend that title. But it's not going to be easy. Um, in terms of a team perspective, you know, I've got great teammates in. As I said, David Weatherall and and, and uh, Paul Karabardak, and we've become back to back European team champions. You know, and um, I owe that success to them because they've played. Uh, every match and, and got the win for us, you know, but it's nice to be part of that team and part of that setup where you get the medal and, and, and things like that. Uh, so, yeah, so being British champ and, and European champ, both back to back, is pretty awesome. I'm very happy with that. Um, I won the US Open in 2016, which was, uh, which was my first singles championship, and, and that felt great because I was in the final with an American who's obviously got very good support over there and, and, and things like that. And, it was a, that was a pretty special feeling, um, and I've got a, a bronze medal at the World Team Championships, um, where I played some doubles and stuff in that to get the bronze medal. So that that was pretty cool. So I've, I've, I've you know I've got some good accolades, but for me, I just want to keep pushing and and you know hopefully um, get to Tokyo. There's a few routes that I can go down to try and qualify. We've got a World Qualification Tournament. Uh, it was supposed to be May this year. It's going to be April next year. So if I can win the World Qualification Tournament, then I've got a place at Tokyo. That would be that would be absolutely amazing and and, and fantastic. Um, but yeah, it's all about just 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 training and, and and trying to get those accolades bigger and better each time, I suppose. What 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 you're feeling about uh, Tokyo, Martin? With you know the obviously the, the right decision being taken to to postpone until 2021, and but but the, there must be an impact on on high performance athletes like yourself and you know, the rest of the team, just in terms, you know, of the qualification process and and psychologically having to to then you know prepare yourself for another another 12 month wait until, until the games come around again. Mm, yeah, exactly. I uh, I totally agree with you that it's the right decision. It's the 100% of the right decisions to postpone the games and, and make sure everything's safe for everyone involved. Um, for me, I see it as somewhat of a, a, a silver lining. You know, the way I'm looking at it is I've got 12 months to prepare extra for the World Qualification Tournament. Uh, you know, so I've got another 12 months to try and develop and get better and, and, and improve my craft before I go to the World Qualification Tournament. Um, so for me, that's that can only be a good thing. You know, it's given me a better opportunity. To, to, to prepare and, and, and be ready for that competition. So understandably, it's, it's, it's difficult for a lot of my teammates who have qualified. And, you know, for some of them that it's going to be their first Paralympic Games, they're obviously desperate to get out there and to compete. But, you know, I think we all understand that the, the right decision has been made. You know, it's, um, I think health, health comes first and foremost, you know, and, uh, you know, sport is just a luxury that we get to play, you know. So the fact that we do it all the time, it's... Uh, it's an absolute bonus, but yeah, we're we're definitely looking at um, Tokyo as a as a major goal for us because since since uh, London, we've been progressively getting uh, better medals. So you know, as a team, we're we're desperate to get out there and hopefully improve again. And, ho and hopefully someday um, we'll see you in a Scotland kit and, and maybe a Commonwealth Games place um, if if the right classification comes along for you. That would be brilliant. Yeah, I would love that. You know, obviously, I um, didn't get to compete at the Gold Coast in, in 2018. Um, I, I, I wanted to. I still don't quite know how I didn't. Um, but yeah, to Birmingham, Birmingham 2022 would be would be amazing to to pull on a Scotland top. Cause it's something the way parity table tennis works is you never represent your home nation. You always represent Great Britain. Um, 
So for me to pull on a Scotland jersey would be would be absolutely incredible. I know that para table tennis has been confirmed for Birmingham 2022, but I still don't know what classes are going to be are going to be there to play. Um, but if class six is there, then uh, I'll be absolutely desperate to, to to represent because it's obviously Glasgow's been. Um, so it's about as it's about as close as I'm probably ever going to get in my sporting career to have a home games. So. Um, so yeah, that would be fantastic in Birmingham, hopefully, to represent Scotland. Outside of table tennis, Martin, you know, I know that you um, you, you've um, done a lot of public speaking, as as we can see from tonight. You're very accomplished, um, and and I know you, you're doing your podcast at the moment, um, which which uh, is, has obviously been keeping you uh, in. Uh, um, keeping you busy during the, 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 the lockdown. Where, where do you see your, your life going? I know you just recently got married as well, so congratulations. Um, where, where do you see your life going sort of after table tennis? What, what's your aspiration for the future? Well, I, I think as you said, I do the public speaking and, you know, I've got the podcast and things like that. So I love something as, as I've gotten older, I, I've realised that I just love talking to people, you know, um, and it's something that's a great way just to, for me, it brings me a lot of energy chatting to folk and, and and doing things like that. So for me, I would love to, you know, go into a role. Um, I could be the first table tennis pundit, <laughs> but um, <laughs> things like that. Yeah, I would love to do some sort of uh, media work, whether that be public speaking to a more um, commercial capacity or whether that's, you know, talking in front of a camera or something like that. It's something I'm very comfortable with and I really enjoy. And um, I think it's a great platform that you can, you can spread a lot of good, you know. So for me, the things like the podcast that I've got, um, which for anyone listening is available on any, any social media platform that you listen to a podcast. Um, other, pod, me, other podcasts are available, yeah. <laughs> they are available. But you listen to um, so, yeah, so for me, um, it's just something that I enjoy. And, you know, the, the people that I've interviewed already um, bring a lot of, inspiration to me you know I've, 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 I've talked to people that just have incredible stories and that's something that I want to keep developing is you know sharing people's incredible stories because it's something that I've found over the years is that you really can change someone's life just by telling them a little bit about yourself you know so I'm, I'm looking for folk to chat to that can inspire people to, to share their story and, and just you know spread positivity it's something that we all desperately need that at the moment is some positive news, you know, and um, for me to do the podcast, it's something that from a selfish point of view brings me a lot of joy, you know, and uh, if I can help spread that to other people, then, you know, it's, it's not a bad bad thing to do in my eyes. Yeah, absolutely. M Martin, you, you, you're a fantastic role model uh, as an athlete and, um, uh, you know, it's we're just delighted that STS was a small part of, of your success. What, what advice would you give to an aspiring young person um, having having had the journey that you've had or, or to the family of a young person? What would be your advice and and, uh, and, and guidance in terms of sport and what you can do for you? Mm, I think um, I'll answer the, the second one first, which is the families. You know, and I think for, for families that have a disabled child, whether that be through birth or an acquired disability, is just treat them like anybody else. You know, there's... Um, there's no need to wrap people up in cotton wool anymore. You know, we've got such an adaptive world, especially here in the UK and, and in Scotland where everything's available, everything's accessible, you know, so just get stuck in, you know, get absolutely stuck in. And, and, and for the young aspiring athletes is the world is what you make of it. You know, if you want to go on and try to become the best in the world, you know, if you fall short and become the best you can be, then that's still pretty awesome. You know, so for me, just 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 keep doing it and keep working hard because, you know, there's a lot of life lessons to be had in sport. You know, and there's a lot of life lessons to be had, especially in the failure of sport. You know, it, it can it can really build a strong character, and that's something that will stick with you for the rest of your life. So yeah, just act like every, you know, treat it like everyone else. You know, that a disability is only what you make it, and also for for the athletes, just just keep plugging away, just keep chipping away, and do what you love. Any other sport that you fancy having a go at? If if, if table tennis, uh, would you fancy another sport, or if, have you ha had a desire? You know, you've talked about football and rugby, and I know you've played a bit of basketball in the past as well. Um, anything that you've maybe not tried that you'd like to to, to to have a dab at? I tell you what, I fancy my chances on a bike. <laughs> 
We've, uh, Gary, Gary's going to be scribbling that down frantically. <laughs> Speak to Scottish <laughs> I, fan, I fancy my chances on a bike. Um, I've been fortunate enough that um, one of my sponsors, WKG Sports, um, during the lockdown period, they sent me up a static bike uh, to train in the house. And I love just just going on it and absolutely smashing a section out and then um, you know having the old jelly legs and walking to the kitchen to get a drink of water after it. And um, I don't know, I think there's, there's something about being on the bike and just being in... Pure physical agony. <laughs> but um, for me, table tennis is obviously what I'm doing. But yeah, I quite enjoy the bike sessions that I do. And um, I don't know, I'd maybe like to give that a go when... Uh, I think that the Wi-Fi in Orkney is just freezing a wee bit by the looks of it. Um, hopefully Martin can come back. Hello? Hello? Yeah, you froze a wee bit there, Martin. Oh, sorry. Oh, we're, sorry. But we got, no, we got the cycling message. We got the cycling. Gary's, Gary's, Gary's uh, noted that down uh, for the future, I think. Not a problem at all. Uh, Martin, th thanks for that. I'm, I'm, I've seen, I know Gary's keeping a note of the, the questions that people are put, putting in chat. So I'm, I, I think I'd like to give uh, pass across to Gary if you want to, uh, some of the questions that have come across, Gary, do you want to? Yeah, there's been a few questions out? come in during the chat, Martin. Um, let me see. One from Heather Loudon. Um, so what do you aspire to do? in table tennis and in life, so a bit about of what's your aspirations as a table tennis player. And we've discussed a little bit of life after table tennis, but what would be your aspirations? Um, so for me, in table tennis, um, as I'm sure you can imagine, I want to be the best that I can be. I want to be Paralympic champion. You know, I want to go to the Paralympic Games and, and represent my country on the highest level there, there is, but as I, I'm incredibly competitive, you know, um, even at at Christmas when we're playing family games, it gets it gets heated. I want to win, <laughs> so um, I want to be I want to be the Paralympic champion. Um, and you know, if I if I fall short of that, then as long as I can be the best version of me playing table tennis, I'm sure that'll be a close second. But yeah, of course, I want to be I want to be the best at that. Um, in terms of life, I just wanna I just wanna help people, you know, and 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 you know that's something as I said, doing the public speaking and doing the after dinner talks and the the podcast and things like that that hopefully gets bigger and bigger it's, it's something that you know people have always helped me throughout my entire life you know and the generosity of people towards me has been incredible and that's something that I know will continue because I'm always going to need help with certain things that I do and you know it's um it's so nice when I, I, I could be in a random country anywhere all over the world and someone's come up to me and like tied my shoelaces or I remember being at an ATM in Belgium and I I got the cash out and dropped all of the money instantly and this guy just picked it all up put it in my wallet and was like have a great day and I was like you could have easily have ran and off with that and done whatever you want you know so people have always been Oh, you still there, Martin? Breaking up a little bit. Yeah, I think the wife. Hello. You back? back. Oh, I'm back. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. Very that. No, that, that's fine. Um, a couple more questions in the chat. Let's come in. One from Matthew Copley. Um, when you're playing for the country for the first time, how did you cope with the atmosphere of the? Of the spectators in the crowd, Matthew, you've clearly never been to an international table tennis event. There's, uh, <laughs> there's nobody there. <laughs> of course, um, it was, it was, it was incredibly exciting, yet very nerve wracking. You know, um, I wanted to do what was best for myself and best for my country, so I did that in the best way that I knew at that time was working hard and and just trying to leave it all out on the table. And I actually lost every match of my first competition um, but I had given everything and, and that's all that you can ask for in, 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 in times like that you know that you just keep trying and keep trying and you know just don't roll over so um, so yeah I lost every match of my first competition um, but 
I was still so proud that I'd represented my country and thankfully I've gone to win a few now. <laughs> Good. And uh, I've got a final question from Caitlin Ross. Um, how did you build the confidence to do stuff like your podcast and public speaking? Um, I think that stems from uh, my family. Uh, I don't have the most... My family aren't shy, but they're not as outgoing as me and, and, and things like that. And I think also the way that I was raised was, you know, I was made very aware at a very young age that, you know, people are always going to look at me um, and ask questions about my disability because obviously it's very visual, it's very noticeable. Um, and so I would always kind of get pushed to the front of things like that, you know, and answer those questions myself and, 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 the, and the likes. And uh, it was just things like, you know, if I was ever going anywhere with my parents and I wanted something or, or was curious as a child, they would make sure that I asked, you know, I asked the question for myself and I think that just meant from a very young age I got comfortable talking to people and I got comfortable with people talking to me and asking questions and things like that. So it just sort of stemmed, I think, from childhood and, and being being thrust to the sort of front and being like, you know, you're, you're going to be in this big bad world yourself at some point you're going to have to deal with it and and that was the experience and exposure that i got so i'm very thankful for that excellent um that's all the questions that are in if there's any more burning questions please take them in just now and um, but i just i just like to say that um that was that was a fascinating listen i think your journey as an athlete is is, is so inspiring um and i think you epitomize a high performance athlete it's a lot it's a long-term thing to become the best at your sport and I think table tennis, is, along with a number of other para sports, take, takes a lot of dedication, a lot of time, and I think that message came across loud and clear. Um, if there's no other questions coming in, I think I would just like to thank you so much for for coming on and be part of this series. It's it's been a great series so far, and you've been an excellent addition. And uh, an extra thank you for doing it whilst you're on your on your holidays in Orkney, and the Wi-Fi is just about managed to, to hold up, which is great. <laughs> Um, and I wish you all your best. Apologize for that. <laughs> no, it's absolutely fine. It's uh, we're we're used to technical difficulties with the, the world we're living in just now, so it was absolutely fine. I'm sure the message came across loud and clear. Um, I just wish you all the best for your qualification for for Tokyo, and absolutely. we might see you in the velodrome in Paris by the sounds of things. So.